All right, I want to go through some of the things you'll need to cover as you're um, putting your essay together and about to send it in so that everybody understands, you know, kind of what's expected of them and, you know, everything can go smoothly here. Now, in the previous video where I went over um, starting the essay and getting it generated um, and getting the ideas, I went through, um, you know, how to pick your quotations, um, how important that is in developing the ideas in the early draft stage. Now, when you're watching this, you should be in the middle to later draft stages and getting ready to send in the essay um, or getting pretty close to it. Now, in the second draft stage, some of the things I went over was um, you should try to get an introduction done. <clears throat> you can get your name and everything else up there. Great. I'll go through that in a little bit more in a title. Um, your introduction should be what's called a summary introduction. Um, you should try to spend about two sentences in the introduction for every body paragraph you have. Now, first time through on the introduction, that might be a little bit rough. What you should not worry about is making general statements or trying to get the reader interested in the topic. Um, since I'm the reader of it and it's my job, you don't have to make any um, outrageous claims for Plato or Wollstonecraft or Machiavelli or anybody. Um, instead, just summarize the main points that you are going to cover in the body paragraphs. Um, a, a rule of thumb is to, to get those two sentences per paragraph, and, and again, it's, it's not going to be any rule written down anywhere, but it is a good general idea um, to try to do that. Um, you should try to give an idea of what's in the quotation and what you're going to say about it. So what are you going to deal with, and then what insight are you going to provide? Because remember in the body paragraphs, what you're doing is providing the evidence, you set the context, provide the evidence, and every single body paragraph should have a quotation of three to six lines. Okay? Every body paragraph should have that. You, have, you set the context of the quotation, you have the quotation itself, you should first start off by describing the words in the quotation itself. So if you have, for example, um, Plato there, um, let's say your topic is going to be, or your focus is going to be on Plato and Wollstonecraft. You have your Plato quotation. Describe that quotation, what is going on in Plato's words um, in those first three, four, five sentences. What is going on? And then you shift at the latter part of the paragraph, at the bottom part, <clears throat> and you get into the analysis. And you're going to be asking, uh, answering that question, why are these words important? What insight do they give us into the ideology of Plato? Your last two to three sentences at the bottom of each body paragraph should answer that question. Why are these words important? What insight do we get into the ideology of Plato or, say, in the other body paragraphs, into Wollstonecraft? How does she see people? What assumptions does she work with? Um, how does she view the use of power? What goal does she have in mind? So that's what the body paragraph should be doing. Setting the context, providing the evidence, describing the evidence carefully and in detail. Make sure the reader sees the evidence from your eyes. And that takes anywhere from three to five sentences. And then get into what does this demonstrate? What does this quotation demonstrate about the value system of Plato, about his or her, I mean, his ideology? Same thing happens in the next body paragraph. Um, and notice with this one, I put the introduction on a separate page, and I'm going to use this one as my first body paragraph on Plato. I put that one on a separate page, and I encourage you to approach it that way. Leave separate pages um, for each um, bit of evidence so that you can develop them. Second one, you know, body paragraph could be on Wollstonecraft. Third one on Plato. Fourth one on Wollstonecraft. And that's the approach I'm going to encourage you to use as you're organizing this. Have the introduction first, first body paragraph on one of the writers, second body paragraph on one of the other writers, third one on the same writer as you had here. So this would be Plato, Wollstonecraft, Plato, Wollstonecraft. And then what you want to make sure is in each body paragraph, you set the context, provide the evidence, describe the evidence, and then explain why it's important. That's your analysis. It's not an opinion. It's not just saying, I think Plato is a nice guy, or I think Wollstonecraft is a really neat lady. That's an opinion. It isn't very useful. When you're going to analysis, you're giving an insight into what's going on at a deeper level. And that analysis will be unique to you, 
but it will provide me, the reader, with an insight into what's really going on and Plato at a deeper level. <clears throat> That's what analysis does. That's what good thinking does. It's good, slow, careful thinking. And that's what's going to happen with Wollstonecraft. You're not telling me whether you like her or you don't like her. That's opinion. We don't need that. Um, instead, you're giving an insight into how Wollstonecraft is working at a deeper level. That's what your analysis does at the bottom of each body paragraph. Set the context, provide the quotation, describe it, analyze it. Set the context, provide the quotation, describe it, analyze it. That is how analytical body paragraphs work in college level essays. <clears throat> okay? They work exactly like that. Doesn't matter what you're working with, we're going to be doing this all semester or all um, session. It's always going to have those elements. Okay? When you're getting to the last draft stage, and now I, I should be clear what I'm calling the first draft stage, the early writing, <clears throat> that might take you several drafts. I'm calling it one, but it might take you three or four times to really start generating some stuff by hand. And in the second draft stage, you might be there for quite some time writing and rewriting it. I spent an enormous amount of time when I was an undergraduate in the early draft stages. Um, I usually wrote several pages of draft for every final page um, of writing. So I spent a lot of time in the draft process. So I'm calling these stages, but it might take multiple drafts at each, each stage. Now, when you're going to the third stage, your primary focus is going to be the formatting in the editing. There are still a little bit of things you can tweak here and there and develop a little bit here and there. And I'm going to talk about the thesis. <clears throat> but the primary goal of the third stage is to get the editing done and to get the formatting done. So that's what I'm going to focus on here. Most of the content should be pretty much done. Most of the content is generated in the second stage. It might take multiple drafts, but overall it's done in the second um, stage. Here, now you're going to put it all together. Now I'm going to go through MLA somewhat quickly because you should have it down from English 101, which is a prerequisite for the class, but I'm going to go through the basics so that we don't um, run into major trouble. First thing with it, make sure you have your name first. Um, so you put Susie Smith. Next is my name, Joseph Pendleton. Then the class, English 104. And then last, the date you sent it in. So in other words, if you choose to rewrite this one later on in the semester, you're going to be using a later date. Same name, obviously, same professor, same class, but a later date. The date it's sent in is the date you put at the top. Up here at the top, at the margin, <coughs> that's the header, put your name with one. You can double click on that. If you don't know how to do that, double click on it. Um, most word processing programs, Word, um, WordPerfect and the others, once you double click on it, it opens it up. Put your last name and then page one. <clears throat> That's all you need. Um, then you put a title. It should be your title. Common title is, you know, Plato versus Wollstonecraft or something like that, or I don't know. Any kind of title that you want to put is appropriate for covering what's in your body paragraphs. Now, the introduction again, what I've just spoken about, just refine what you have. As you go through and read it in the last draft stages, you should be reading those sentences out and make sure they sound good. Your own ear should guide you quite well. Another good idea is to come to the writing lab here on campus. I really want to encourage you to do so um, and have one of, the, have one of the students there, or one of the um, instructors there, read through it and guide you through it and um, try to find out if there's any issues. And your introduction, and this is a rule of thumb, not written down anywhere, should be about three quarters of a page in length. If it's going to cover all those body paragraphs, it usually is going to take about three quarters of a page in length. In most cases, it goes down to the bottom of the first page at least. If it's shorter than half a page, you are probably not setting up your body paragraphs effectively. Okay? So there's not a, a set rule of length for the introduction, but a good guideline is an absolute minimum of half a page, a maximum of a full page. Um, good idea, try to get it to about three quarters of a page, then you've done the job of getting about two sentences per paragraph. After somebody reads your introduction, <clears throat> they should know what's going to happen in the body paragraphs. They, do, they should not need to read your body paragraphs. They already know. It's like when you look at a map, you know how to get from <clears throat> Victorville to Las Vegas, you know. 
You don't need to drive it yourself. You actually know how to do it already. Um, and that's great, right? <clears throat> so the introduction is the map, and the thesis statement is going to be your insight. It's going to be your reason, the reason for the person to read um, the essay. That's going to be the thesis statement, and I'm going to come back to that in a moment um, to give a little bit more. So, but to be very clear about this, the introduction is the map for the body paragraphs. Now, an important thing, um, many people misunderstand the introduction. They think, well, I don't want to give away the body paragraphs. This is not a mystery novel. It is an essay. What you want to give the reader is a good map so that as they work their way through this, they know where they're going. Now, an important thing to keep in mind also is you do not need quotations in your introduction. If you want to use a little bumper sticker quotation, Plato is known to have said blah, 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 or Wollstonecraft, blah, 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 <clears throat> a little one, fine. But remember, quotations are used as evidence. They're used as evidence to be carefully considered and analyzed, to prove ideas. Introductions do not prove your ideas. Looking at a map on how to get to Vegas is not the same thing as driving to Vegas. Actually doing it is the actual experience of it. It's, it's much more detailed, takes more time, um, <clears throat> much more involved. The body paragraphs do the heavy lifting of the essay. They are going to prove the ideas. They are obviously the heart and soul of the essay itself. The introduction sets it up. The body paragraphs do the real work that needs to be done. So the introduction just sets it up and tells you where you're going to go. After you look at the map, you know how to get there. You know how long it's going to take to get to Baker and everything to get to the state line and all that. But you haven't done it. The body paragraphs are going to do that. <clears throat> okay? So good introduction provides a good map. It doesn't leave any mysteries unsolved or anything like that. This is an essay. Um, we're students. We're not Agatha Christie. We're going to go for um, giving an overview of what's coming up. They know what they're going to get when they look at it. <clears throat> okay? You don't want to look at a map to Vegas and suddenly end up in Ontario. Okay? You want to you know where you're going. Okay, okay. Um, and I'm going to come back to the thesis. Now, everything from the front to the very end, including the work cited, should be double-spaced. Everything needs to be double-spaced, including the quotations in the body paragraphs. Everything is double-spaced. You should, I would advise, using Times New Roman um, as your font choice. Okay? Definitely use 12-point. Times New Roman is the usual expectation of most instructors. It's not actually MLA. Many people do misunderstand that. But it is the usual expectation, and it is a little bit easier on the eyes for reading. I would encourage you to always default to Times New Roman. 12-point is required. Double-spaced is required. Times New Roman is just a darn good idea. So I would urge you to have the entire essay front to back, double spaced, Times New Roman, 12 point. Okay? Times New Roman, again, is not required. You can put it in Arial, but <clears throat> I would encourage you to go with Times New Roman. Now, once you're moving from this stage to this stage, you no longer have separate pages for each individual paragraph. You don't have you know, double returns between the introduction and the first paragraph. Everything from start to finish is double spaced. So with this one, the way I've mocked it up is as if the thesis statement started on the first page and ended on the second. That can happen. And then you int uh, indent, <clears throat> start typing away to set up your body paragraph, or set up your quotation. Now, quick thing I will go through. I'm hoping that most of you know how to um, format quotations. I'm going to cover it kind of quickly. <clears throat> you go, if, it, if the quotation... I want to be very clear about this. If the quotation is four lines or more of your type, four lines or more of your type, then you're going to do a block style quotation. If it is fewer than four lines, three and a half is less than four, um, then you're going to integrate it. But if it's four lines or more, then you're going to use a block quotation. What you do is indent entirely on the ones on the left hand side. Everything comes in one inch on this side. Everything. You don't change the font to, you know, and put it in italics or anything like that or single space it. Don't do any of that. <clears throat> okay? Just bring it all in one inch. No quotation marks are needed any longer. The indenting, the block quotation style, demonstrates that this is a quotation. You don't need the quotations anymore. 
Okay? So you <clears throat> bring in everything one inch on this side, on the left side of the page. On the right side of the page, it should still be flush with the um, rest of the, um, uh, the essay. So I've got it kind of bumped in here. Don't need to do that. Um, so everything should be flush on the right-hand side of the paper, and the quotation is bumped in one inch on the left side. The page number comes at the end. Only the page number within parentheses. Only the page number within parentheses. You do not need to put Plato 3, um, Plato page 3, page 3, PG period 3, any of that. You don't need any of that. All you need in parentheses is the page number itself. I acted as if this is a quotation for page 3, so I have a little 3 inside there. And that's all you need. Okay? So that's it. So everything in one inch on one side, double space, don't change the font. MLA tried to do it in as effective and simple as a method as possible. Once you get this down, you're set for the rest of your college career to do this in the right way. Um, <clears throat> and there should be a period at the end after that. When you start the paragraph up after the quotation, if it's a block quotation, you start it at the margin. You do not indent after a block quotation. You do not indent after a block quotation. Okay? So just start it up at the margin and start typing it up, finish up your paragraph, because really it is all one paragraph. Okay? Let's say I went to the second body paragraph. This was my number one. This was my number two. That's down here now. This number two down here. I set up the context and then I got to the quotation. It's integrated. This quotation is um, about three lines long. Okay, again, rule of thumb is three to six lines. Try to get it three to six lines. This one's about three lines long. I have the quotations. I go to the quotation itself, write the quotation out, and then I have the quotation marks at the end, quotation marks at the start and at the end, and then all I need is the page number. Here I act as if it were page 14. Put 14 at the end in parentheses. This is very important. All you need is the page number. You don't need to put Wollstonecraft 14. The only time you need to put the um, writer's name in the parentheses is if it's unclear who the quotation is from. Okay? If I did not know this was a quotation from Wollstonecraft, if I were just citing some research, and that happens a lot in um, science essays, if you're just citing research and the name of the person doing the research doesn't matter, then you do need the name in the parentheses. With this type of essay, when you set the context up, you're probably going to mention Wollstonecraft's name and set up the quotation effectively that way. You don't need her name after the um, quotation. And then I go on, third body paragraph, and then let's say this is the fourth right here, same type of stuff. This is a block quotation. I describe it in detail, and then I do another one, blah, blah, blah. And at the end of the essay is your conclusion. <clears throat> at the conclusion, what you do is you start off with a restatement of your thesis statement from the beginning. And I'm going to come back to the thesis in a moment. The first sentence of the conclusion should restate your thesis statement. State it again at the very beginning. Use slightly different words, um, so you're not you know, exactly repeating yourself. Use slightly different words, but restate it, and it kind of says to your reader here, this is what you really learned. This is the insight you gained. Restate that thesis statement and then summarize the main analysis from each of the body paragraphs. You can do it this way. Write your thesis statement. Look to your first, second, third, and fourth body paragraph. Look to the insights that you gave at the bottom of each one. Okay? So remember, your body paragraphs set the context, give the quotation, describe it, and then they have the analysis. That's your insight. Look to the analysis at the first, second, third, and fourth body paragraph and just Write out four sentences, really bringing every, all your analysis together at the end. What the conclusion does is it brings all the insights together, which is much like the introduction. But the introduction gives a little bit better idea of which quotations you're going to deal with. It gives a more detailed roadmap. Okay? Think of the conclusion as once you've arrived in Vegas, telling your friend, boy, didn't we have some great Greek food in Baker? Well, you probably didn't, but maybe you did. <clears throat> I don't know. But just a quick little summary of the trip once you've arrived. This is what we did. This, these were the highlights. Those are your insights that go in the conclusion. Okay? 
Um, works cited should have two different listings. Two different listings. For this one, if this were on Plato and Wollstonecraft, I'd have one for Plato and then one for Wollstonecraft. I just put one for Plato up here. Now, I won't go into the detail of what's involved in a work cited again. You should have it from English 101. If you don't have it down and don't have all the format down, um, go to, I would um, encourage you to go to OWL at Purdue University. Um, they have a great website on how to do the work cited. <clears throat> okay? I think it's best if you do it that way, then I go into detail right now. But the basics of it are, put the author first, put the um, title of the reading you did, which is, for this one, Allegory of the Cave. Um, it could be, you know, selections from the prince, um, or things like that, or, you know, the Laute, um, it's, uh, Laute, see, or whatever tongue, or whatever it is, um, or the um, Allegory of the Cave, or the Pernicious Effects of uh, Unequality. Um, that title of the piece goes in here. <clears throat> then, the title of the book is really Political Readings, um, Political Science Readings for English 104. That's really the book. That's this, okay? I would like you to treat this as the book itself. And again, yes, I know I produced it and, you know, posted it up there. It's a little bit um, um, not too fancy, <clears throat> but I want you to treat it as if it were a full book. It's Political Science Readings is the book, okay? Put down, edited by Joseph Pendleton. I wasn't the author, so you don't put my name first. I didn't write Allegory of the Cave, darn it. Then you put the city. The publisher is going to be Victor Valley College. Comma, and then nine, excuse me, 2016, okay, is the year. That's what should be at your work cited. One for, if you're doing Plato and Wollstonecraft, one for Plato, one for Wollstonecraft. If you're doing Lao Tse and Machiavelli, one for Lao Tse, one for Machiavelli. Okay, so two citations in your work cited, <clears throat> okay. Overall, that should get you done for most of the format of the essay. You should be in good shape. Now what I want to cover is how to do the thesis. You may have already written a thesis, but what I'd like you to do is revise it at the end and try to follow this format, because I think this format will probably make life a lot easier when you're writing a comparison contrast essay later on in your life. This structure to the sentence works quite well, I find. <clears throat> There's two possible structures. It depends on whether or not your essay um, provides a real insight into the differences or into the similarities. <clears throat> For example, if you do two conservative writers, Plato is generally considered to be conservative. If you want to take him as liberal, that's great. Fine with me. Um, but if you did Plato as a conservative and Machiavelli as a conservative, and again, some people I've seen write good essays with Machiavelli as a liberal, um, and it does work. It, it can work. It's, it's up to you and how you carefully analyze it. But let's say you took Plato as conservative and Machiavelli as conservative. Okay? And on the surface, that's easy to find the similarities. But what you did through your analysis was to find a really different type of conservatism running through both of them. So on the surface, they're both easily conservative. But when you analyze them, you found real differences between them. Okay? What you can do is what I'll um, point out is this first style of thesis. And let's say we're doing Plato and Wollstonecraft still. <clears throat> both Plato and Wollstonecraft blah, 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 blah. And you can give your insight into how they both do something that's similar. And most folks might see that, how they're both, you know, argue for this, that, and the other thing. But, while Plato, blah, 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 Wollstonecraft, blah, blah, blah. What happens with this structure, both Plato and Wollstonecraft, blah, 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 that points out the similarities. <clears throat> Again, remember this is a comparison contrast essay. This structure first puts the comparison up front. And then what it does is it shifts with this type of structure. But while Plato, blah, 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 <clears throat> it says Plato out here and going in this direction, Wollstonecraft does that. So it sets the contrast in the second half by doing this, but while Plato, then blah, 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 comma, Wollstonecraft, blah, blah, blah. So you can see the comparison at the front, both Plato and Wollstonecraft do this, 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 comma, 
but while Plato, this, this, and this, comma, Wollstonecraft, that, that, and that. That structure sets up the comparison and then brings in the uh, contrast at the end. Okay? So look at your essay and see if you did that. Um, or what you can do if you did <clears throat> two writers who on the surface, for example, I get a lot of students writing about uh, Machiavelli and Lao Tse. Um, a lot of students like to do that essay. If you did that, on the surface, these two writers are clearly distinct from each other. Writing from different time periods, one is considered to be the arch-conservative, the other considered to be an arch-liberal. Um, again, you can take them differently. You know, again, I've seen people take Machiavelli as a liberal, and I've seen Lao Tse um, shown to be conservative. Um, but in general, <clears throat> most people would see them as being quite distinct. So what you can do, and here I'm going to still keep working with Wollstonecraft and Plato, but it's that same structure turned on its head. If your insight is really to show a comparison between two writers who look different, try this structure. It's the same thing but turned on its head. While Wollstonecraft, blah, 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 comma, Plato, blah, 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 that set out the comparison, excuse me, the contrast. It sets out the contrast at the beginning. While Wollstonecraft, blah, 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 comma, Plato, blah, blah, blah. It sets out the, con uh, the contrast between them. Then, comma, but both Wollstonecraft and Plato, blah, blah, blah. And then what I do is show how they're quite similar in the second half of the thesis. This thesis statement is quite difficult for most students to write. And so this setup of either bringing them together and then showing their difference, or showing their difference and then bringing them together. That allows students to really organize the comparison contrast method of thinking. But you can't really write this until you've got your essay good and together. And then you should be able to look at your body paragraphs and go, okay, I'm going to go A style, do the comparison first and then do the contrast. Or I'm going to go B style, do the contrast first and then do the comparison. Depends on which writers you took and how you um, interpreted them, but that's the way I'd like the thesis to be done. And the thesis, keep in mind, is always one sentence. It cannot be two sentences, and it's always the last sentence of the introduction. So the thesis statement is always one sentence, and it's always the last sentence of your introduction. And I would encourage you to write it either A style or B style here, depending on what you have in your content. Okay. So try to get the essay in, or you must get the essay in, um, by Thursday night, um, by 11.59 p.m. Attach it um, to an email and send it in to me. Try to get it done a little bit before, but attach it to an email and send it in to me, and I will try to get these graded as quickly as I can, um, but I am a very careful reading, reader with the grades and everything else, and I try to give people um, a good deal of feedback. So try to get it to me. I'll try to get them um, back to you as soon as I can. But we're going to start on the economics essay before I finish grading this one. <clears throat> um, so next unit's going to be economics. Those readings will be up, but focus on getting this all cleaned up. And tune me by Thursday night by 11.59 p.m. Take care.